Okay, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's National Virtual Summit presented by the SAMHSA's Gaines Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health and Services Administration. Today's summit is entitled Advancements in Crisis Response, Preparing to Pivot, which includes two panels. Uh, you heard our, if you were, well, if you're just joining us, welcome. And uh, if you're stayed with us, uh, I guess we did something right. So thanks for staying with us. Uh, our second panel this afternoon is titled Ensuring Meaningful Crisis Response, Utilizing a Three-Prong Approach of Someone to Talk to, Someone to Respond, and Some and, and a Place to Go. With the presenters, Arnold Remington and Krista Lewis, who I will introduce shortly. I am Mike Hatch. I'm a senior project associate at the SAMHSA Gain Center and Policy Research Associates. Before we start our presentations, uh, I have some housekeeping items to review. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you have any questions for the presenters or in regards to the technology, please type them in the Q&A pod found on the bottom of your screen. At the conclusion of the presentations, we will address as many of your questions as time permits. We'll also be conducting a couple polls through the event and appreciate your participation. When you see a poll pop up on your screen, such as the one that just did, please enter your responses. The session is being recorded and slides will be disseminated via the GAINS listserv following the event. We will also notify you when the recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of this session. Please note this certificate is for personal portfolio use only, and we will not be able to offer any CEU credits. There is ASL interpretation for this event. The interpreters for today's event are Justin Anderson and Dave Gratzer. Um, there is also live captioning for today's event. To view live captioning, click Live Transcript CC, and then select Show Subtitles. We'll take a quick look at today's uh, agenda. And unfortunately, Michael Clay's uh, is having some technical difficulties and I don't believe he's been able to join us as of yet, but we'll keep an eye on that. After the presentations, we've, uh, we've reserved some time to uh, address your, your questions. And I'd like to introduce our, our speakers briefly. Arnold Remington, is, a li is licensed as an independent mental health practitioner and certified professional counselor in Nebraska and a consultant with Policy Research Associates providing training and technical assistance services that draw on his extensive experience as a provider of behavioral health services in the area of emergency behavioral health and crisis intervention to include extensive work with law enforcement, adult and juvenile detentional facilities and hospital emergency room settings. He has served as a director of the Targeted Adult Services Coordination, uh, acronym TASC, uh, program, a multi-agency collaboration since 2005. Prior to that, he worked as a counselor for the State Department of Corrections in Lancaster County Youth Assessment Center and in outpatient and private practice clinics. Krista Lewis is the Chief Program Officer of Mental Health medical and crisis services at the Family and Children's Services in Tulsa, Oklahoma. At FNCS, she collaborates with community and agency partners to develop, implement, and expand innovative strategies to meet the needs of vulnerable children and adults. Ms. Lewis is a licensed professional counselor. She has 32 years of experience working with all ages across the, life, across the lifespan continuum. Currently, her passion and professional focus are on creating medical and crisis services that meet the on-demand individualized needs of children, families, and adults. 
so here's uh, some results from the first poll that we had. Um, Looks like uh, from our attendees, 35% are from rural areas, 22 are from suburban, and 44 are from urban areas. Um, organizations that are uh, with us today, uh, looks like a pretty good chunk of uh, crisis services and, and government policy folks, uh, community-based providers, uh, and about 5% are uh, law enforcement. So thank you so much for taking time to answer that poll. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Arnold Remington to begin our presentation. Arnold? Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, do you want to move to the next slide? Um, so as, as Mike said, my name's Arnold. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, crisis response, and I'll give you an overview of the the task program um, models to consider um, in terms of crisis response, response options within those models. I'll talk about 988 uh, and law enforcement responses and, and relate that to this morning's presentation. Um, and then also one of the big things that's important to all of us is uh, funding. And so I'll look at cost savings and how, how give you some thoughts on ways you might calculate that in order to support the services you provide. Next slide. So the, the task program uh, developed in 2005. And if you were part of this morning's uh, group, um, Dr. Draper talked about deinstitutionalization. Um, and in, in 2004, Nebraska passed LB 1083, which is our behavioral health reform and, and closing of the regional centers and move to community-based care. Um, so with that, um, the task program, specifically crisis services, was one of the components that was developed. Um, and we did that by taking some existing programs, case management services, combining those, and then uh, adding the crisis response element. Um, and then we created a, our, our own program um, with those. So we have four partner agencies, originally three, um, and then we added an agency about eight years ago. Um, the task program covers uh, 16 counties, um, and I'll go over that a little bit later in the presentation. We respond to both county and municipal law enforcement agencies, and within that 16 county coverage area, there's about 32 different law enforcement agencies that we respond to. And then our 988 response is currently under development, um, and I'll talk a little more about that as I uh, get into the presentation. Next slide. Um, so with the task program, since it is a collaboration of, of the four different agencies, we developed an advisory board, which is made up of the directors of each of those agencies. Um, and then that's who I answer to. I, I'm the program director, so I answer to the board. We have uh, regular meetings, um, and it functions very similar to a traditional board. Um, and then I oversee our crisis response teams, where I have one full-time crisis counselor that covers daytime, and then after hours, I have a pool of seven on-call staff, um, which um, surprisingly is the same staff from 2005 that have stuck with me throughout the years. And they they cover on-call and rotations. Um, and we have the 16 counties divided into two coverage areas. And then I have oversee our case management program, which consists of eight emergency community support staff, um, five intensive community services staff, um, and then four recovery support staff um, that's split up into substance abuse and mental health recovery 
based services. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a map of region five and Nebraska is divided into six regions and region five uh, is on the southeast corner of Nebraska. Um, and the Lancaster County, which is towards the middle of that, that blue area on the map, is our urban area in the capital of Nebraska, the city of Lincoln. Um, it, population is about 319,000. Uh, um, within those 16 counties, our smallest rural population is 2,600, and the largest is 21,000. So with those law enforcement agencies that we cover, um, my smallest department that we serve has one officer, that's the chief. Um, the largest has about 25 officers in the rural counties, and then average is eight to 10 officers. Um, so that's something we considered when I, I developed the model. Um, next slide. So back in 2005, when the task program started, one of the first things I did is I consulted with uh, Major Sam Cochran, who back then was still with the Memphis Police Department and had developed the crisis intervention uh, team model, CIT model. Um, so I looked into that and, and one of the things I realized quickly was it was that model was just hard to implement with the size of our departments. Um, and at the time, um, the model really stressed the 25% of the department trained. Um, and when you have eight to 10 officers average on department, it's, it's more of a challenge to do that. Um, so like I said, I consulted with uh, Sam and then I, I ended up up looking at the crisis response model, which we ended up going with. Um, a crisis response model is typically um, the least expensive of the models to start. Um, you can adapt them to large coverage areas in multiple departments. Um, the success is based on the partnership of law enforcement and clinicians. So that behavioral health, law enforcement, um, relationship is is critical um, with all the models, but especially with crisis response. Um, uh, a crisis response model is easier to operate on a 24-7 schedule. Um, they can also play a large role in training law enforcement, which is one of the things that I found as we developed um, was crucial in establishing relationships was, was partnering to address law enforcement training needs. Um, remember most academies, and although this has increased over the years, most academies average around eight to 12 hours of mental health training for law enforcement. So there is lots of opportunities for behavioral health to, to strengthen relationships by meeting that need. Um, and I always say this is an important fact that, that we forget sometimes in the behavioral health world, but it is, it is paramount that as mental health, we understand what officers in our service areas can and cannot do by statute. Um, the more you understand that, the better you are able to function as a team. Um, and, and sometimes we operate in a system in which we expect other people to do things and we don't know what their roles are. So really understanding what statute allows officers to do or not to do um, can greatly benefit a crisis response team. Um, the second model um, to consider um, is co-responder, which has become more and more popular and common over the last several years. Uh, you see them in a lot of communities. They are more expensive to operate because co-responder by definition is a clinician and an officer going together. A lot of times uh, they are employed by the departments. Um, one of the limitations with co-responders is they're typically not 24 seven. And that again is related to the cost to operate those programs. 
Um, so you'll see co-responder programs that operate either during normal business hours or they'll do an alternate schedule um, like, you know, late afternoon to early evening. And then how a lot of them operated as calls come in after that, um, the call is, will, will be logged and then when they start their, their shift, um, they'll pick up on follow up with that call. Um, they rely on a dedicated officer partnered with a clinician, um, some, a social worker, and sometimes fire or EMS will, will partner in that role versus law enforcement. Um, and then some models use unlicensed crisis responders for that co-responder role. Very good program, uh, very different model. Um, next slide, please. The third model I wanted to mention for you to consider today is a, just a referral program. Um, these are cost effective. Um, they can be run by peers or trained crisis responsors, but typically they're not licensed staff. And, and the referral program is simply that. It, it's um, So from the task perspective, we, we developed a referral program utilizing case managers. And what it did is for law enforcement officers that had contact with individuals that didn't meet um, statute requirements to intervene, the officer could send a referral to us. I would assign a case manager, case manager would follow up. And the, the real critical part of a referral program is they would then circle back to the officer and let him know, yeah, the person accepted services. No, they didn't. Um, and in our, our region, that program was, was taken over by our lo local mental health association and is now run by peers um, and is, is very effective. Um, but it's another model to consider, and it's again, it's tailored to meet a specific need. Um, but also very, very effective and, and very cost effective to run. Uh, next slide, please. So um, 988, as we all know, is coming up in July. Um, and there, there are differences. The, the task program was designed to be a law enforcement driven crisis response model, which a lot of our crisis response across the country operates very similar ways. 988 is designed to be a community response um, crisis line um, that provides, in theory, better access, quicker access for community members without having to go through the emergency system. Um, 988 is going, going to rely on call centers. Um, so in Nebraska, it'll be run by our Boys Town hotline. Um, and that'll vary from state to state who operates those call centers. Um, call volume is currently unknown for 988. And that's probably the biggest challenge. And uh, this morning's discussion, we talked about some of that. Um, is we don't know. So when you're looking at developing a, um, a model to respond to, one of the things that often, like when we developed the crisis response or the task program, we had all kinds of data on calls and helped determine the model and what we did. 988, we don't have that yet. And that's going to have to be gathered as we progress. Um, the other thing that has at least come up locally in our 988 planning group is safety. So when you move from a, a law enforcement driven model where you have an officer present um, and you go to a community based model uh, with outreach, you have to think about safety and what that looks like um, in the, that environment. Um, so that's, that's one factor. And then, it, then you look at law enforcement, as I mentioned earlier, you have to understand statutes. So what officers can and cannot do, what are the officers roles in, in conjunction with the crisis team? Um, you have to consider funding, um, which when the task program started, um, one of the departments I met with gave me very, very good advice. And, and you know, in the behavioral health world, we function on grants 
And that's, that's our normal world. We apply for grants, we offer services, we lose grants, grants expire, services change, et cetera, et cetera. From law enforcement's perspective, you know, one of their frustrations is that's the way we operate from behavioral health. So when, when I started, you know, I came in and said, this is what we're going to do. And I had to one, deliver on what we said. And then also you have to think, how do you continue the service without it being di disrupted? So funding's vitally important uh, in your response. And also it, it assists in building that trust and knowing that you have a service that's gonna stay in place. Um, the final thing I want to say on, on law enforcement and your response, if, if that's the model you go with, is the services need to be tailored to individual departments. Uh, you don't want to use a one-size-fits-all model, which, it, again, in behavioral health, we tend to do. Um, but departments vary. Um, like I said, the department with one officer versus department with 25 or 200 officers operate very differently. And I have found departments even in the same counties operate very differently. Sheriff departments versus municipal departments operate differently. So you need to really assess what are the needs of the department you're serving um, and then develop your model around that. Next slide, please. Um, if you're familiar with the sequential intercept model, this is intercept zero and one. And you can also find more information on this on the SAMHSA website and also Policy Research Associates. But intercept zero is the community uh, services uh, intercept. And that this is where 98 going to live ideally. Um, and then intercept one is the law enforcement side, so the 911 side, and um, different states are operating differently as far as whether 988 and 911 will be connected. I know in Nebraska currently the decision is they will be separate lines, um, but at some point hopefully those, those two will merge. But this is how the intercepts function and where that crisis uh, Will, will take place. Um, next slide, please. So some considerations when you're, you're looking at the model um, and, and we're discussing 988 is what's the goal of the model being considered? Um, so what, what do you hope to accomplish? Um, and then the, the important question is divert to what? So if you're gonna meet the goal, what diversion op options exist in your community? So if you're going from a 988 call center to an outreach crisis response, what resources does that crisis team have access to in order to assist that person in crisis and keep them in, in the community without escalating to, in this case, a 911 call? Uh, next slide, please. So crisis response options are telephone, telehealth, and in-person. Now, again, uh, it's going to depend on your coverage area and the goals you define on what your response is. Telephone is good, but from the be behavioral health side, limitations are we can't see body movements. We can't assess what we don't see. We're only hearing, but sometimes that that's still a good intervention and, and it's better than no intervention. Telehealth is all of us have become well versed in telehealth thanks to the pandemic. Um, but telehealth is a great resource with lots of options. Um, and I think as far as 988 goes, the, the consideration there is how does the person access it? So if you have a, a call patched to you from the 988 call center, um, and that family does not have access to internet or equipment to do telehealth, what other options are there? Um, and then the, the final one is the in-person response, uh, which is, is always good. Um, challenge with in-person response is you got to take into account drive times and those type of things. 
Um, and we're all dealing with staffing issues, so you have more limits that way. Uh, next slide, please. So understanding cost savings when you're looking at the models, whether you're choosing crisis response, co-response, or referral, is you got to define what that goal and then how does that goal translate to cost and then cost savings. So with the task program, for example, our, our budget was $250,000 annual budget of, of last year. Uh, during that same time frame, we had 255 total calls, 217 diversions, which in our case, diversions are something different than an involuntary placement. So we're, we're getting that person somewhere else, which gives us an 88% diversion rate. Uh, next slide, please. So in our local system, an emergency protective custody placement costs $500 a day per to stay. Um, the average length to stay for that individual in a protective custody placement is three to five days. So if we're able to divert that 88%, that equates to 325 to 542,000 savings compared to our, our budget of 250,000. Um, this doesn't include officer time, hospital cost, emergency room cost, inpatient cost. So there's other factors you can, can look at, but I think it's from a program perspective, when you're developing your model, it's, it's really important, especially when you're looking at funders, whether that's city or county government, if you can show cost savings, um, you, you can help secure your funding with that data. So it's, really important. Uh, next slide. Um, so with that, um, this is my contact information. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me and I'm going to turn it over to Krista. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Arnold loved your presentation. Um, I have the opportunity to talk about a place to go. And uh, uh, next slide, please. So Family and Children's Services is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, this year we're celebrating, last year and this year we're celebrating our 100th anniversary. Uh, our goal as an organization really has been uh, to continually assess the needs of our community and to bridge the gap offering innovative solutions uh, to test the lives of the most vulnerable uh, and hurting in our community. We offer a wide range of services across the lifespan, uh, including uh, approximately 60 different programs, ranging from outpatient mental health for adults and children to jail diversion, court programs, uh, as well as uh, homelessness and housing. Uh, we're proud of our history. Uh, we've done a lot, but we're so excited to see the future unfolding, seeing 988 come into play and looking at full continuum of crisis services coming into so many communities. It's, it's exciting to see uh, that all uh, coming to life in front of all of us. Um, our organization has been transitioning to a CCBHC over the past four years. Uh, through uh, multiple SAMHSA, CCBHC grants, and then finally uh, this past year, our state became a fully um, a, a, a transitioned into a, a, a CCBHC state. So in October of 2021, we transitioned our entire organization into CCBHC. Uh, and as we continue to learn and grow within that new model, uh, the crisis services continuum that we have created um, has really become a vital component of, of that model. Next slide, please. So Family and Children's Services began developing its uh, crisis services continuum back in 2001. Uh, we uh, enhanced and expanded on a community model that had been in existence since the 1980s that really focused on outreach and uh, uh, providing crisis intervention for individuals who are homeless. Uh, 
when we began uh, in 2001, we transitioned that program into what we now call the COPES program, the Community Outreach Psychiatric Emergency Services Department. And they were transitioning from focusing just on homeless individuals to offering a 24 seven crisis hotline and mobile crisis response for Tulsa County as a whole. Tulsa County is about 650,000 uh, uh, individuals just to give um, size uh, frame of reference. Uh, at that time, access was limited to a place to go when you were in crisis. Uh, we had approximately 56 inpatient uh, beds, and that was, for the most part, all that we had for anybody who needed a place to go. Uh, most of our independent hospitals shut down their units, uh, and so we, we were really struggling. Many of our individuals in our community that uh, were experiencing mental health crises would wind up having to be transported uh, outside of our community many times up to six hours away uh, for treatment. And we just felt that that was not okay. We needed individuals to be treated here in their community so we could really wrap their supports around them and bring in uh, family and friends uh, to be a part of their recovery journey. Uh, so today uh, we have worked collaboratively with our community partners, police, fire, and the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, and many other partners to create a one-stop, no wrong door crisis care center for Tulsa County. Uh, this center offers multiple access points uh, across Tulsa County. Next slide, please. In an effort to create a new portal into our crisis continuum services and create greater access to crisis assessments and a place to go, uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to travel to Houston uh, and visit uh, Jennifer Battles along with our director of 988 as well as uh, our deputy um, chief at the time uh, to visit and learn from Jennifer and the Harris Center uh, how to embed inside a 911 center. So we were able to take lessons learned from Jennifer and uh, embed a licensed mental health therapist within our Tulsa area 911 center, uh, really pretty seamlessly uh, having brought our, our folks with us, they were able to see that, that this was successful and could really work. And how it be quickly became a portal into our crisis, uh, our crisis care center, is that as individuals were calling 911, we could quickly engage uh, that caller and either help stabilize that uh, situation over the phone, or help them get transportation and uh, be able to meet with someone face to face at our crisis care center. Next slide, please. One thing I'd like to mention is that since we started our, our 911 services, we've engaged 1,300 individuals. So I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So then providing um, you know, further support for a place to go when you're in crisis, Family and Children's Services expanded its partnership with Tulsa Police and Tulsa Fire to create a community response team. Uh, I think many people um, have learned uh, over the last few years um, the, the success of co-responder models. This particular model for us, uh, we went to Colorado Springs and were able to uh, see the CRT team there in action, and that is how we informed our, our particular practice. But for us in Tulsa, the way that this helps us with a place to go um, you know, one, we're able to really rapidly um, assess the situation on site and give one vehicle in which an individual can be transported to meet with someone face to face in our crisis care center, uh, allowing them to um, release other law enforcement, not having to have five or six or seven vehicles arrive. We have one, uh, the law enforcement offers so is able to secure the environment for the individual in crisis as well as the team. Uh, but then the mental health professional really can uh, spend some one-on-one -on -one time and, and find out what the needs and uh, the severity of the situation so that we can then communicate with the crisis care center when they're on their way. Uh, so we're already planning and preparing 
for that individual uh, so that they'll feel welcome and safe and secure when they arrive. Next slide, please. So this is our crisis care center. Um, we have been in existence now since uh, 2013. Uh, this was really a, a vision of, uh, that was really exciting for us as an organization, but also as a community. Uh, we partnered with uh, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse here in Oklahoma to open up. This was the second urgent recovery center in the state of Oklahoma. When we first opened, uh, we only had uh, eight uh, urgent recovery center chairs uh, that were for 24 hour respite and rapid crisis stabilization. We also offered 16 crisis stabilization chair uh, beds. This was a huge add to our community because um, we were able to keep so many more people in uh, in Tulsa where we could engage their families. Uh, I believe we, we drastically re re reduced the number of transports out of our community. I wish I had that exact number right here right now, but I don't, uh, but it was significant. It had a significant impact. Uh, I remember uh, this, this was the first urgent recovery center in Tulsa. The very first person who walked into our center uh, you know, sat down and talked with us and we offered him to come into our urgent recovery center. And he walked out the door because he, he didn't want a chair, he wanted a bed. Uh, he had never heard of such a thing as sitting in a chair and he didn't want to do that. And uh, the next day he came back, uh, met with us again and said he, he would try our, our new service. And uh, that, that was really the start of it. And it has caught on quickly in our community. Uh, today, we have expanded our unit to offer um, 20 urgent recovery chairs. So we've grown from eight chairs to 20 chairs. On average, at any given time, we have somewhere between 15 and 18 of those chairs filled. Uh, we have capacity to go up to 22, but we like to keep it uh, no more than 20 just for space and comfort, you know, making individuals feel comfortable and at home. When we first opened up our urgent recovery center, we also did pretty much a traditional crisis assessment. Let's sit down, let's talk, um, what's going on? How can we help you today? And, and we would do a full assessment before anyone went on the unit. When we transitioned, uh, uh, let's see, I think it was December of 2021, we transitioned to our new 20 chair unit. We put all of our staff on the unit to do an ongoing um, reoccurring assessment of individuals. What we found is that when people walked into our center, they really weren't in a place where they could really tell us everything that was going on a lot of times. And so by allowing them to do just a brief screening, so we knew just a little bit of high level information and have them come into our crisis care center, our therapists, our behavioral support specialists, our psychiatry team could really take time, really ask questions over um, a period of hours to really determine what was going on and what the needs were. What we found is that we were able to reduce any types of seclusions. We were able to better respond to the needs of our, our, our um, individuals we were serving. And it allowed people to have time to rest and relax before they really got into the discussion of what had brought them there to us um, that particular day. Uh, we also, at that time that we expanded to 20 chairs, we knew our community really needed expansion of beds. Uh, so we um, were able to add four additional crisis stabilization beds. Um, our average length of stay is typically about seven days. Uh, the model is three to five, but what we have found, especially uh, since uh, COVID, our length of stay has gone up uh, on average to, to seven days. Um, I'm looking at my notes and I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Uh, let's see. One of the things I, I wanted to share was um, within our within this center, and I'm and I'm pretty certain that this is something that all of you that are have joined us today have uh, experienced as well. 
uh, in your centers and, and within your services in general is that since we have come out of um, our, you know, our country's lockdown, we have really seen uh, an increase in acuity and an increase in uh, the use of, of substances. Uh, we, this has changed a couple of our data points. One, we've seen a 16% increase of individuals who are actually accessing our care. And we have, uh, out of our urgent recovery center, our goal had originally been, and we were successful, at discharging to home from our urgent recovery center at about a rate of 65 to 70%. Uh, that was a, a huge addition to our community because prior to the urgent recovery center, all of the people that we were rapidly stabilizing and discharging to home were looking for inpatient beds. So we were able to open up uh, a place to go and a place to go in, in individuals' community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we're seeing post-COVID is our discharge rate at this point uh, to home is about 50 to 55 percent. Uh, still, still not bad. We, we'd really like to get back to 65 to 70 percent, uh, but the acuity is such that individuals are really in need of a, a greater um, level of care. Next slide, please. Actually, I apologize. I should have advanced to that particular slide uh, as I was talking about the Urgent Recovery Center. Uh, next slide, please. So to further support our community of uh, family and children's services, um, I worked with the city of Tulsa and also with the Department of Mental Health to create this um, transition into a one-stop assessment center for the um, for Tulsa County. Uh, we were trying to reduce the number of times first responders used a hospital or um, emergency department for crisis response. We wanted to be the location where all law enforcement officers and community would come for um, urgent recovery. Um, engagement and crisis assessment. So we did a complete uh, renovation of our unit. Uh, this was at the same time that we expanded the 20 chairs and to the 20 beds. But you can see we created a, um, a law enforcement entrance only. Uh, this did a couple of things. We serve any, I think we serve nine law enforcement agencies at this time. And it allowed for just rapid access to our um, crisis center, we were able to reduce their wait time from 30 minutes to 10 minutes. Uh, we really were just a one stop. All we want to know is what was the situation? How did you come to encounter this individual? And then we would take it from there. Even if an individual wound up having a medical crisis at the time, we took care of that. We made sure they got where they needed to go. And we just got law enforcement back um, on, in this, on the street. But at the same time, we still had a front door for the community. So we created a simultaneous uh, response team inside our center so that as soon as someone came in our front door or if at the same time simultaneously an officer arrived at, at our Sally Port, we could help um, create a welcoming environment for either door, no matter who was coming into our center. And we have found that that has actually reduced wait times at both entrances. So that has been a huge addition to our community. Um, next slide, please. Our newest portal to a place to go are iPads um, within law enforcement vehicles. Uh, we are working diligently to get a a, an iPad into every vehicle. We're, we're not quite there yet in Tulsa County, uh, but we're working on it. How this feeds into a place to go is that a law enforcement officer can quickly access a mental health professional through the iPad and be able to touch one icon on the screen and they have immediate access. So that mental health professional can aid in helping that officer get an individual to the crisis care center uh, very rapidly and uh, even help do a brief assessment and if there is any need to offer additional services between uh, the time that the officer is engaged the individual and getting to the crisis care center. 
Uh, with iPads, it's really pretty amazing. A law enforcement officer never has to, to really respond alone. Uh, so many communities, uh, it, ours especially, um, Tulsa uh, County, Tul the city of Tulsa has, has really had some very unfortunate um, situations in, in recent years. And law enforcement officers really get put in a situation where they need to be social workers. And sometimes that's not uh, what they signed on to do and not their, their best, um, their best uh, skill set. So we are really excited about being able to have them not respond alone anymore. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be in person. Uh, we can be there with an iPad. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we know from, from research um, is, and one of the things that we have really struggled with our crisis care center is being able to bridge individuals from receiving care in our crisis care center and bridging to an outpatient provider. Uh, we have found that if an individual is engaged in outpatient provide, uh, engaged with an outpatient provider before accessing the crisis care center, their engagement at discharge back with their outpatient provider is about at 88%. However, if it's an individual that has never engaged in outpatient services or does not have an outpatient provider at the time, it's only about 42%. And our goal is to increase that engagement at discharge. We um, love the fact that we can be there at the time of the crisis, but we really want to offer that wraparound service from the discharge to the engagement with, it, with outpatient services. We have really strong uh, partnerships with outpatient providers across our city. So we partner with um, other CCBHCs and other um, outpatient um, providers so that we can get an individual engaged wherever they're the most comfortable and where they want to be. So we, um, in February of this year, so very, very new, we have started a new program called the Transitional Care Bridge Pro Project, which is currently being funded through a SAMHSA CMHC grant, which we're, we're so very grateful for that. But what we're doing is we're facilitating the discharge process by providing peer support, a nurse, and a therapist to wrap around the individuals until a therapeutic relationship can be established with the community provider. We know from research, we know um, when we're able to make that engagement that re crisis response can decrease. An individual can reduce uh, calling 911. They can reduce um, needing a mobile crisis response. They can have a relationship with a provider that can help them uh, identify when they're experiencing a crisis and, and deal with hopefully be able to um, divert from having to have another inpatient uh, or even a crisis stabilization stay. So we are informing uh, this particular project through, transitional, through the transitional relationship model. And thus far, uh, we're really excited. Um, we've seen some very early data that indicates that we have seen a slight improvement in our engagement uh, we see that within the first few months, we've been able to increase engagement to 55%. So we were at 42%, we're at 55%. So in a few months, being able to wrap around individuals as they are discharging and stay with them in the community and develop that relationship while they're still at our crisis care center and move with them into the community uh, and stay with them until they have that uh, therapeutic relationship established is, is early promising to be just a really tremendous add-on to, to our continuum of services. Next slide, please. So um, that is uh, the end of my presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I did not put my contact information on this slide. I will put it in the chat. If anyone would like to reach out and has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to do so. Thank you, Krista. Um, before we get to our, our next speaker, I just want to, there's a couple questions in here that could probably be answered uh, just right away and quickly. So allowable time for stay in the urgent recovery center is it under 24 hours? 
Uh, for, for yes, it had been for a considerable amount of time, and we um, we still try to stick to the twenty three hours and fifty nine minutes. But our state received an uh, um, an IMD uh, exclusion waiver, which allowed us to expand our beds beyond the sixteen. So that's when we moved to twenty, and it also limit it also reduced the expectation of under twenty four hours. Okay. How about uh, EMS? Does EMS use the Sally Port, or do they not respond uh, directly to the center? Uh, yes, they can respond directly to the center, and because of um, the way it was designed, uh, EMS still comes through the front door. If we if we have that response, they come through the main door, and then, um, but we get them directly on the unit immediately. But for 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 access reasons, we we needed for them to come through the main door. Okay, um, and uh, what about the, um, this was a question that came up in the 988 um, one that the first uh, um, panel that we did earlier today, um, and, and I didn't get a chance to ask it. I think it was Lieutenant uh, Misty Snodgrass asked a similar question uh, earlier today regarding special population of first responders in crisis. Are there any sort of, uh, um, plans or any sort of programs or plans if you have first responders such as police officers or firefighters that are in crisis? Within our state, we have, um, we have um, dedicated specialty units for individuals who are first responders. Uh, we have responded, we have been available. Uh, we have those partnerships within our, um, commun our community what we have found is that uh, peer uh, peer programs within the fire department and within the police department have chosen to um, focus on using those dedicated uh, units and those dedicated services. And same question to you, Arnold. I, I would uh, uh, say the same thing. We, uh, because of our relationships with law enforcement, we have done quite a bit of um, that type of response to law enforcement and also to law enforcement family members. Um, but they also locally have access to critical incident stress management debriefings. Um, and then a lot of departments offer EAP services to officers too. But yeah, it's an important question. And um, I think also goes to the trust developed with their the behavioral partners in law enforcement. And it looks like my Zoom might have froze. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Sketchy, sketchy service right now. And with that, we will move to Michael Clay's presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. Krista, Arnold, what a great service you guys both offer. Um, very informative and very necessary. Um, my name is Michael Clays. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer for Behavioral Health Link out of Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here to talk about the uh, Georgia Crisis and Access Line. It's operated by Behavioral Health Link. Um, you can go to the next slide. Behavioral Health Link um, provides services in about a half a dozen states. Um, and that consists of technology uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, crisis call services and mobile services. In Georgia, we've offered all three um, at a county-based level, starting in 1995. Uh, back in 2005, right around the time Katrina hit, Georgia had a flood of uh, refugees from Louisiana, and that really exposed um, the very, very fragmented system of 27 or 30 different call centers uh, numbers for people to call in crisis and difficulty getting people into services um, at that time. And so that's where the company, uh, that's where the state, I should say, of Georgia Department of Behavioral Health Services um, decided to do a statewide uh, contract for um uh, for for uh, the crisis line. And so I'm going to throw out a number at you, 1-800-715-4225. 
1-800-715-4225 will be a test at the end of this because uh, I want to compare your memory recall for between that number, which is the number that's been in place uh, in Georgia uh, since 2005, and the number 988. Um, there are billboards uh, that uh, people pass in Georgia and at 80 miles an hour probably uh, read that 800 number. And I, prior to joining BHL about a year ago, I served as executive director of a large safety net hospital in downtown Atlanta and for about 10 years I feel like my career was to uh, figure out creative ways to divert people from coming to our large emergency room uh, and uh, quickly realized that this service offered by BHL was one of those ways we set up some partnerships to uh, to put that in place and so uh, as you see here we're funded by the the State Department of Behavioral Health um, we, in addition to telephone services, we're using text and, and chat. Uh, we developed that uh, back in 2015, and we're uh, serving all individuals. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, um, uh, as, a, as kind of a crisis hub, I mean, this kind of sums up the, all presentations, I think, right? Uh, the, the whole idea uh, in behavioral health that you've got somebody to call, someone to come see you, and and some place to go. Uh, in the medical world, you call 911, an ambulance comes out and treats you on the scene and, and takes you to the hospital if that's necessary. And so what we found in our operations, um, we receive over 200, and last year we received over 275,000 calls. Uh, and about 85% of those calls, we were able to resolve them over the phone. And I can't tell you how valuable that is, being somebody who uh, would come, would, would meet people all the time, who would walk into an emergency room because they had no other alternative. They didn't memorize that 800 number that I mentioned earlier. In fact, we would discharge people from the hospital with paperwork and they would come back a, a week later and, and we would say, call this 800 number, they will help you. And of course, what did we hear? I lost my paperwork. So uh, I'm, I'm leading all this up to the, I think the huge impact of 988 is going to have on creating just a much larger front door for behavioral health services and and it all trickles down uh, obviously in, in, in Georgia behavioral health link also operates mobile crisis teams um, we, we uh, we're not co-responding with law enforcement we, we send out a peer with a licensed clinician uh, and we do that uh, two-thirds of the state we we oversee in terms of providing those services and so 75 percent of those uh, calls that we receive that we dispatch to our mobile teams, um, we're able to resolve there in the field without somebody needing a higher level of care. Uh, and again, that's a that's a real important. You know, the benefits of those mobile teams obviously are um, we're relying less on law enforcement uh, to to have to intervene, um, able to support somebody there in the community. And, it, and it's all ages, all disabilities uh, that, that we're serving. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, people want to be um, served in a, in a local community instead of having to go to an emergency room. Um, Behavioral Health Link does not offer uh, inpatient or, or crisis units. Uh, we, we do have a strategic partnership with RI International and other states where we, where we kind of bundle all this together. Uh, obviously, having that place for someone to go is just very important. Next slide, please. So what is the Georgia Crisis and Access Line? It's a, obviously a toll-free number where people can get help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We, we do take calls uh, from the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, uh, and that number, that 800 number, will, will soon become 988 and people calling that number uh, will be directed to, to our Georgia call center. And so uh, we work hard obviously to have our, our staff uh, trained in de-escalation uh, assessment and referrals. We're able to make referrals right there over the phone with people. So if they're calling and they um, uh, need an appointment at two o'clock in the morning, we have a network of providers loaded into our software. So we're not just giving them a phone number to call the next day. We're able to uh, connect them to services uh, a, 
immediately. Um, and then a couple other things, so the three legs of the stool that I didn't mention earlier would be the, the, um, the crisis lines, the mobile uh, dispatch teams that we have, and then we maintain a, uh, a bed registry where we're able to, through partnership with the state of Georgia, be able to see where there's bed capacity available for crisis units. So if someone shows up into the emergency room that I was previously responsible for, um, we, we are able to uh, connect them with the, the nearest open bed uh, and um, facilitate that transfer, which obviously helps those hospitals out quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of just the visual of all that I'm, I'm talking about, really kind of a single point of entry. Uh, again, uh, Georgia, the state of Georgia, by consolidating all of those different telephone numbers into to one single number. Um, you know, a lot of communities, and, and it's natural, a lot of the resistance at that time was, how are you going to do this from Atlanta when I'm down in South Georgia, uh, five hours away? Um, we need local resources. And that, that today, I think, still uh, uh, rings true in a lot of communities. However, uh, the difference in the pros and cons of everything being local is when you have peaks and spikes in volume, you don't have the capacity to roll over to a larger network, essentially. And so our ability to, to maintain a statewide uh, crisis and access line really is supported by the fact that we, we have software that allows our call agents to um, find that uh, resource in uh, someone's rural community, uh, be able to dispatch a, a, a mobile team to go see them in that rural community, and then if somebody needs the bed registry to track them uh, through that process. Next slide. Okay, this just kind of touts a little bit about our uh, innovative software that, that really is a uh, growing need. We're able to track outcomes data. We're able to um, uh, connect all of that together when it comes to calls and, and crisis services, uh, which provides valuable information to state behavioral health authorities. Next slide. So, how do calls come in? Again, we're taking a wide variety of calls. It's called the Georgia Crisis and Access Line, right? So it's a crisis hub. On one hand, we're doing lots of different follow-up for people where people are calling for routine services. Um, obviously, if we can resolve it over the phone, we're going to do that. Uh, we work closely with Georgia ha operates two peer warm lines, and so we work closely with those peer warm lines if, if that's necessary. And, and of course, about 2% of our calls do require active rescue. And so when that's the case, we are engaging 911, staying on the line with the individual, uh, working closely to get emergency services to them as quickly as possible. Slide, please. So our staff, um, in total in Georgia, we've got about 500 staff uh, dedicated to the mobile teams in the field and, uh, and, and our call agents uh, as well. And so uh, they are our staff, people staffing the, the call center are made up of peers, uh, crisis counselors with various degrees supervised by licensed uh, mental health professionals. Next slide. So you can see here just kind of an idea of the variety of um, entities and stakeholders that are calling us throughout the day looking for help uh, for somebody, um, it, it, whether it's a probate court uh, calling us a judge, um, needing our help to facilitate that, uh, various providers, et cetera. Um, we're receiving anywhere between 400 and 1,000 calls a day. And, and those of you who are familiar with call centers, the unpredictability of call volume is, is obviously one of the biggest challenges. And so we're naturally really anxious about 988. Um, 988, actually, the, the, they do have some vibrant, made some projections that state of Georgia has adopted. I told you we took 275,000 calls last year. That number is supposed to increase to 1.3 million calls uh, by in, in five years. So an increase of five-fold, which Georgia's population is 11.7 million. 
So that really is only 10% of the population that would potentially call uh, 988 for access to behavioral health services. Uh, 10%, and we know that 20%, uh, Nami and tell us that 20% of individuals experience some behavioral health crisis during the course of the year. So uh, we, we feel that wave is coming and uh, we're gearing up for it to be as prepared as possible. And then the, the next slide talks about just outbound calls. So as a crisis hub, we are, um, you know, not just connecting somebody, uh, talking to them on the phone and giving them a telephone number. We're making sure that, uh, that they've connected to that provider, um, that that handoff has been made and um, frequently about we receive 100 calls. 50 of those calls, we're doing outbound calls uh, either to the to the individual themselves, the entity that called us, or um, uh, to the provider to make sure that the individual um, received the services that they we, they were referred to. Um, so I think that's my last slide. Next slide, yes. So there's my contact information. Um, uh, Obviously, these three legs of the stool, someone to call, someone to go see that person and a place to go um, is, is just an incredible opportunity right now with 988. It, it really will magnify uh, the, the need as people become, you know, that, that, that number becomes easier for people to recall with a little bit of marketing. Um, we certainly feel like uh, those projections that I mentioned earlier are going to be accurate. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Arnold. And thank you, Krista, for those uh, uh, very informative uh, presentations. Uh, we have some time to address uh, questions from the audience. If you have not already, please type your questions into the Q&A pod uh, on your screen, and we'll answer as many of them as time per permits. Uh, and I'll start right in with the questions uh, for our panelists. Uh, um, this one's from uh, Vivian Demian. Uh, how does the crisis response team transport consumers to community from the community to crisis receiving center? Uh, do they use EMS, police, or a crisis team vehicle? Usually, uh, what we use for our crisis response team uh, in Tulsa is um, it, it really depends upon the the. The situation with the with the individual. There are times when we use EMS, and there are many many times when the crisis response team just transports in the uh, in their vehicle. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Jolene Jennings. Uh, how does BHL secure safety for MCRT professionals to respond without law enforcement co-response to secure scene? What are protocols currently and with plans for 988 implementation? That's a great question, Jolene. So um, safety is obviously our, our priority. When, um, when before mobile uh, team is dispatched, uh, obviously an assessment is, um, is conducted and we're doing as part of that assessment, we're doing an environmental uh, scan of, you know, what is the environment like that the person's going into are there weapons involved, et cetera. So, um, and, and we also have a pairing with that kind of a five level uh, acuity scale where uh, one would be law enforcement, an active rescue of course would be law enforcement goes out uh, on their own. Uh, level two would be law enforcement leads and our team is following be behind law enforcement. Level three would be our team leads and law enforcement is, is available uh, as needed and of course, the level four would be we're going out on our own. So we're, we do train our staff to select one of those levels based on the, the circumstances of the particular uh, case. So Michael, it's, um, it's a risk deeds responsivity type of um, chart for the levels of response that you're utilizing? That's right, that's right. Very, very similar to uh, what D.D. Uh, Hirsch uses in uh, California regarding uh, the, the LAPD response. Exactly. I've seen that. And yes, they're very similar. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, there was a follow-up question I had for you, Michael, here in the, in the chat real quick. Um, how about uh, any services for first responders in crisis? 
Well, yeah, I mean, we obviously work very closely with first responders. We we have a dedicated line uh, for for uh, either 911 or law enforcement to to call us, and uh, we have some partnerships or referral options where we we don't again we're we're assessing and referring. That's our primary role, and and we're going to offer that to anybody who calls us. Uh, but there are programs uh, in in Metro Atlanta dedicated to first responders. Um, and just a just a quick reminder: if you do have questions, uh, put them in the Q and A uh, pod or the, the the box at the bottom, if you would, uh, just so I can I can pull them out. Um, it's it's hard to go through the chat with so many folks on these calls. So if you could put those in the Q and A, well, it'll be much easier for us to get to those. So thank you so much. Um, the uh, so Debbie Palmer has a Debbie Palmer Thomas has a question. What does the clinical programming look like for someone in short term chairs? Sure, um, Krista. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the the short term chairs that we do offer um, some groups. We do offer time for an individual to meet with a case manager with a therapist. But what we have found most of the time in the first 24 hours, it's really a time of rest and have something to eat, um, assessment, meet with a psychiatrist. So there isn't a full milieu. It really is catered and designed to be a, a very unique experience for each individual who, who um, comes to the center. Okay. Uh, Brad Munger asks, uh, what is the breakdown across programs between adults and youth? Um, I'm assuming that is that is that directed toward it's a it's a program specific question it doesn't say which um, okay which one really so wow I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that question I'm gonna I don't have that the, those numbers but I'm, I'm gonna guesstimate that about 70 percent of the individuals we're 75 percent to 80 are are adults our, our numbers would be similar, Michael. We're, we're in that range, 20 to 25 percent youth calls. Okay, and how about, um, have you seen an increase in, in uh, juvenile needs for services? Yes. Yes. Significant. Across the board, huh? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Let's see here. Um, looks like that's it in the, in the Q&A. Um, section here. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's gonna, that's gonna do it for us. Uh, um, <clears throat> we are coming to the end of, of our time for today's uh, um, summit. If there are any other questions, uh, you know, we do have some time here. If you want to throw them in the Q&A, please feel free. Um, Kim Huber, uh, I'm, he I'm hearing there are uh, dedicated lines for first responders. Are they staffed by current or former law enforcement first responders, either peers or with clinical experience? Um, that's what's being sought out. I don't, I don't know as if uh, you guys can actually speak to those dedicated lines specific to first responders or not. I mean, for us, the, the typically the first responder is calling on behalf of somebody else in the field. So yes, we do have uh, dedicated lines for those individuals, uh, emergency room settings, et cetera. Um, it, you know, if, a, if somebody who's in law enforcement or uh, EMS uh, is, is in need of services, then again, we're, we're going to follow our protocols to evaluate and link them to uh, the, the appropriate services to help them out. Okay. Um, question for you, Krista. Uh, you mentioned an increase in substance uh, use issues. Uh, can you speak to the types of substance use crisis you are seeing and how your organization has adapted to the increase? Uh, follow-up question to that is, do you have any suggestions as to how 988 can best address SUD crisis? So for, for our urgent recovery uh, center, for the crisis care center, we see uh, 
a huge increase in individuals who are coming to our center with substance-induced psychosis. Uh, they are using um, our number one um, drug um, of choice that's coming through the door is uh, meth, then marijuana, and then alcohol. Uh, individuals um, usually wind up staying with us, usually due to um, uh, symptoms of psychosis, uh, danger to self and, and others. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the rest of your, your question, Mike, I apologize. Um, let's see, uh, so proto protocols, uh, no, that's not it, um, I, I switch, oh, do you have any uh, suggestions as to how 988 can best address SUD crisis? I, I can certainly say that I am not the expert on that, um, but I think that in, in even in our current environment, and then I would say as we, we pivot to 988 is, um, you know, getting, getting people to safe environments, um, whether that is um, engaging law enforcement or family, or if the individual is able to get themselves to, to a safe place. But of course, um, I, again, I'm not the expert on, on that, but that, that, I don't think that um, 988 is going to change the need to get people to a safe environment where they can detox and be in, a, in, in an environment with people to keep them safe. Hey Mike, can I comment on that? Yes, please. Um, I, I think some of the challenge, like Krista said, is I don't think 988 is going to change that. I think some of our, our barriers have to do with lack of um, treatment resources. So with substance abuse, we want to get that person to a safe place where they can detox, but a lot of communities wait lists are extraordinary for treatment services. So when an individual is ready for treatment, they don't have access to it. They don't have the right supports to stay sober and clean. Um, so it, it's, I think it's a huge challenge in our community. Also from the emergency side, um, Unfortunately, I think it's common for individuals with substance abuse, once they are clean and sober, they're kicked out of the emergency system. And unless they actively want treatment, we're not gonna force it on them. So there, there's, I think lots of gaps and perhaps some opportunities with 988 to maybe better identify those needs um, and, and then support the need for uh, more providers in that area, so. Thanks, Arnold. I, I think the um, the increase in peer warm lines is going to really be needed. Um, some do exist, um, you know, as a preventative measure, obviously, for individuals struggling with relapse. We we rely on peer warm lines now. Um, but their capacity is limited, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Bob, this is kind of a, a combination question for, for all of our panelists. Uh, <clears throat> there's two questions I'm gonna kind of fold it into one here, but uh, um, did you encounter any resistance or what were your biggest challenges to systems improvements and how did you find ways to overcome those? I can say uh, when we started, um, you know, back we started in 2005, and back then crisis response was was new. And you know, I heard a, a chief one time say, "Police, uh, law enforcement hates change, but they resist the status quo." And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And and with law enforcement in particular, I think it's being consistent. And as I mentioned when I gave my presentation, doing what you say you're going to do. Um, Sam Cochran also told me, um, you continue to provide services to those who want it and the others will come along. And that proved to be true, um, and especially with law enforcement. Law enforcement is an incredible group of people to work with, but they're their own culture. And you have to understand that and work within that. Um, so I think it's it's those things, being persistent, understanding the population you're serving, and doing what 
you committed to do. Very well said. I agree. There's always like resistance. Follow up. Yeah, and there's always resistance to change. And I alluded to it earlier, you know, when you go from a fragmented system, Georgia is one of a handful of states that has a single number to call statewide for people in crisis. Again, 988 will, will magnify that nationally. Um, but, uh, you know, when you, when you take a, a network of mental health centers who are operating their own lines uh, and, and, consolidate all of that, of course, there's, there's resistance. And I think um, as, a, as a nation, we'll have to struggle with, you know, efficiency versus kind of the local model, um, you know, and, and uh, certainly it's our perspective that the economy of scale that you get by having a, a larger call center allows you to be much more responsive to people than uh, a network of small call centers. Thank you. Um, question for you, Michael, from uh, Brad Munger. Uh, what is the data platform being used by GCAL? It, we developed it our own, our, on our own. It really started off with an Excel sheet years ago and tracking, uh, um, uh, you know, tracking provider network. And um, we've we've built a pretty elaborate. I call it the TurboTax for crisis counselors because it's guiding people through a kind of an imminent risk screening, you know, to determine right off the top does this person need a, uh, you know, an active rescue, and and kind of provide some some guidance for them, guardrails around you know, dispatching mobile and outpatient referral. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we're seeing in the field is that we had the luxury for years to employ licensed clinicians to be able to answer these phones and due to workforce shortages and due to increase of calls, um, the, you know, where the credentials are becoming fewer to, to, uh, to find. And so many states are staffing their crisis lines with volunteers and, um, you know, um, and, and so we're, we're working really hard to um, help our call takers have a consistent protocol with anybody that calls us. Um, and, and so that, uh, you know, we're, we're having those consistent outcomes. Right. And our, our final question is also from Brad. Are there particular tools or protocols being used to screen for substance use disorder? There's the cage that is used, so we used to use in the hospital. Um, you know, for us, we're we're calling, we're, 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 we're kind of following the caller's lead in terms of what they're calling for uh, and not necessarily trying to diagnose them uh, per se. But, um, you know, if they're calling with a substance use need, then, then obviously that's what we're focused in on and we'll zero in on, you know, withdrawal risk, et cetera. We, we, it's the same thing, Michael, we use the cage. Um, and, and I think some of the challenges the substance abuse crisis, if that translates to a, a call out from 988, um, how the crisis, the mobile response interacts with that particular person. And then I think it comes to what resources does your community have that's immediately available. So like Krista said, if, if we can't get that person to some place where they're stable and supportive and can, can uh, come off that substance, we're likely going to have that call escalate to a 911 call. So, uh, um, so that's going to conclude uh, the Q and A session of our uh, presentation today. I, I, I want to thank uh, Michael Clay's, uh, Krista Lewis, and Arnold Remington so much for being here and being a part of this and taking time out of your day to present on all of the great work that your communities are doing. Um, we are um, coming to the end of uh, the, the, the summit here. So there are two resources that you may download now from the chat box. Uh, we have let you know that there is an attendance certificate for this panel. If you're interested in downloading that for personal use, you can download that now from within the chat box. You'll also see our last poll for this afternoon popping up as well. If you'd like to provide any input 
for additional technical assistance or other areas where you would like related information, then please indicate that. Uh, and this information will be shared with SAMHSA. If you haven't signed up for the GAINS listserv, I encourage you to sign up. And the link is here on your screen. Uh, just enter that link into your favorite web browser and it will take you to a place to enter your information. And you can make sure that you stay up to date with all of the GAINS Center's activities. Thank you again for your participation in today's event. If you have any other questions or comments, the GAINS Center the Gain Center's direct contact is here on the website that's on your screen. You can go to samhsa.gov forward slash gains hyphen center, or here's a phone number to directly reach us. Goodbye, and thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. Bye.